Days after Christmas of 1920 in Los Angeles, a crime would occur in which the LA Times would brand the most horrible crime of the 1920s. And to this day, over 100 years later, it still remains one of the most brutal, evil and cruel in American history. The case begins with Frances Marion Parker, known as Marion to her family and friends. Marion was born on October the 11th, 1915, to a close-knit family, consisting of her parents Geraldine and Perry, her older brother Perry Jr, and her twin sister Marjorie. The family had lived at 1631 South Wilton Place, a modest home paid for from her father's success as a prominent banker. Marion was a well-behaved and timid child who attended Mount Vernon Junior High School in the Lafayette Square section of Los Angeles. December the 15th of 1927 was a normal day for the Parker siblings. They had headed off to school as they did each morning. Being that there was only 10 days left before Christmas, they were excited for the upcoming festivities. However, that afternoon, a well-dressed and well-spoken young man entered the office of Mount Vernon Junior High School and introduced himself as Mr. Cooper. He then went on to ask the school registrar, Mary Holt, for the Parker girl. Mr. Cooper told Mary that his boss, Perry Parker, had been in a terrible car accident and requested for his daughter right away. When Miss Holt had asked which one, the man seemed surprised as he hadn't known that there were two little girls, neither of whose names he had known. Nonetheless, the school secretary, Naomi Flinton, brought Marion Parker to the school office and the two women excused Marion to leave with the stranger. Promising to take her to her father, Marion climbed into the passenger seat of the man's coupe and they drove away together. Little had it been known was that Perry Parker had been in no such accident and was in fact still at work that day. Later that day, Marion's mother Geraldine became concerned when Marjorie came home without her twin. She telephoned the girl's schoolmates and friends, but no one had seen Marion. Concern soon turned into fear when Perry received a telegram that read, Do positively nothing till you receive a special delivery letter. The letter had been signed off with Marion Parker. In a short time, a second telegram arrived. This one had read, Marion secure, use good judgment. Interference with my plans dangerous. This time, he had signed off the letter with Marion Parker and George Fox, presumably another alias. Perry contacted school officials who explained what had happened with Mr. Cooper. It soon became clear that Perry had not known anybody by the name and had certainly not sent a stranger to collect his daughter from school. At this point, Perry contacted the police. It was clear that someone had abducted his 12-year-old daughter. Officers wasted no time and arrived to the Parker household to take Marion's description. These descriptions went to the press right away. Chief of Detectives Herman Klein ordered every officer to take part in the case and expressed his grave concerns about the little girl's whereabouts. Perry and Geraldine grew more overcome with worry as the hours passed, and none of these efforts revealed a single trace of Marion. The next day, a ransom note arrived at the Parker home, demanding $15,000 in gold certificates for the safe return of Marion Parker. This note was followed by two more like it, all three ominously signed, Fate, Death and the Fox. One letter included a postscript in Marion's handwriting which read, Daddy, please do what this man tells you or he'll kill me if you don't, your loving daughter, Marion Parker. The kidnapper sent instructions to deliver the money to Temp Street and Gramercy Place. Desperate for his daughter to be returned, Perry followed the instructions which had specifically warned him against any police involvement. Sadly, the police who were casing the Parker home followed Perry without his knowledge. The kidnapper fled as soon as he caught on. 
After the failed exchange, more letters were sent assuring Perry that Marion was still alive. For now. He claimed that Marion saw him during the botched handover. He said she had wondered why her dad hadn't helped her. The kidnapper then told Perry to wait for a telephone call and cautioned him to keep law enforcement away. That call came at 7.35pm on December the 17th. The kidnapper instructed Perry to bring the money to West 5th Street and South Manhattan Place in Los Angeles. Perry was there, cash in hand, by 8pm. As Perry sat desperately waiting for the kidnapper to turn up with his daughter, sure enough, a Chrysler Coupe pulled up slowly next to Perry's car. The man in the front seat had his face concealed with a bandana, and brandishing a firearm, he asked Perry if he could see it. Perry replied in the affirmative, and asked if Marion was alright. As Perry leant over close to peer into the car, Perry saw that Marion was slumped in the passenger seat. She's sleeping, the kidnapper reassured the distressed father, and as Perry handed over the money, in that instant, the car sped away up the street and pushed Marion out onto the curb. Perry immediately jumped out of his car and ran to his daughter, still believing that she was asleep. He cradled his little girl and noticed that her face was pale. To his horror, this was not all. Marion had been choked so hard that her head had been severed. Her eyes had been wired open to make it appear that she was still alive. Her killer had severed her arms and legs, and her internal organs had been removed and replaced with rags. Her organs were later found strewn around the LA area. In that moment, any hope that he had was replaced with enormous grief. Dr. A. E. Wagner performed the initial autopsy. Completely unaware of who laid beneath the sheet on the autopsy table, he was shocked to find that it was the dead body of his little neighbour, Marion Parker. On December the 18th, civilians walking in Elysian Park spotted bundles wrapped in newspaper and secured with a length of twine. Inside were Marion's limbs and organs. At 620 Manhattan Street, a woman had noticed a suitcase on her front lawn. It contained blood-soaked papers and a spool of thread, the same thread the killer had used to sew Marion's eyes open. Police initiated a nationwide manhunt for Marion's killer, consisting of over 20,000 police officers and volunteers. Someone had already leaked the morbid details regarding Marion's manner of death to the press. The people of Los Angeles were enraged and feared for their own children. The Parker family and generous citizens raised a $100,000 reward for the killer's identification and capture, dead or alive. During the investigation, police grew suspicious of Perry Parker's former employee, a young man named William Edward Hickman. William had been a messenger boy at First National Bank, who was convicted for forging stolen cheques in June of 1927. He served time for the crimes partially due to Perry's testimony. On one of the telegrams from the killer, the address, 2518 Birch Street, Alhambra, was scrawled in the bottom corner. This address turned out to be the one where William lived with his mother, Eva, the previous year. The towels stuffed into Marion's abdomen were marked Bellevue Arms, the name of an apartment building located at 168 Bellevue Avenue in Los Angeles. On December the 20th, police went there to investigate and encountered a man who fit the description of Marion's abductor. He identified himself as Donald Evans. Donald allowed the police to search his apartment, number 315. Although police found no evidence, Donald Evans disappeared. Investigators later learned that William Edward Hickman had rented apartment 315. Undoubtedly, this was the man who had killed Marion Parker. Police soon located the car that was used to get the ransom. The owners had reported it stolen weeks prior in Kansas City, Missouri. Prints from the notes matched those found on the vehicle as well as fingerprints on file from William Hickman's previous arrest. 
Hickman's photo was plastered all over the newspapers and sent to every police department in the West Coast. Officers had no leads to William's whereabouts in the early part of the investigation. A gas station attendant in Oregon thought that he recognised William driving a green Hudson sedan. Then, in Seattle, a $20 ransom note was used to purchase cold weather clothing. It seemed that Hickman had taken a vacation to Oregon with the ransom winner. The police up north were on high alert. On December the 22nd, 1927, two Oregon police officers were enjoying a smoke break in Echo, Oregon, when an unmistakable green Hudson sped by. The officers drove over 40 miles per hour until they were alongside the stolen Hudson. They pointed a pistol at the driver who had half-heartedly gave chase, but eventually pulled over. William didn't struggle when they arrested him. He only shrugged his shoulders and stated, well, I guess it's all over. When Perry Parker learned of the arrest, he told reporters, I feel a sense of deep and sincere thankfulness that the man has been captured and that mothers no longer need fear that he may carry off their children. William admitted to the kidnapping right away. After the arrest, LAPD extradited him to California by train. He was docile whilst in captivity, but had tried twice to commit suicide in the train's washroom. These, however, were feeble attempts designed to convince his guards and later the jury in his trial that he was insane. Thousands of curious spectators gathered at stations along the route of the train, hoping to catch a glimpse of the murderer who had been featured prominently in the previous week's headlines. William Hickman simply waved and smiled at them. During the trip, he had penned a 19-page confession to the murder of Marion Parker. His motive, he said, was that he wanted to go to college and needed money for tuition. Later, he was paraded in front of spectators at the Pendleton Jail and interviewed by countless reporters. William Hickman could not keep his mouth shut and seemed to love to bask in the spotlight. He stated that he and Marion had actually gotten on very well and he had only killed her when she realised who he was. The two had met before when she accompanied her father to work. William claimed that he strangled her and dismembered her body to make it easier to conceal. Then he realised that Perry wouldn't pay for a child who was dead, so he filled her full of towels and sewn her eyes open to give the appearance of life. The trial began on January the 25th of 1928. The not guilty by reason of insanity defence was new in California. William intended to use it and began behaving erratically. He also wrote to another inmate and asked how to act crazy. I've got to throw a fit in court, William wrote. I intend to throw a laughing, screaming, diving act before the prosecution finishes their case, maybe in front of old man Parker himself. During the trial, he would mumble to himself in his cell and pretend that he couldn't hear people when they spoke to him. To complicate matters further, William also confessed that he had murdered a pharmacist named Clarence Toms during a hold-up with his buddy, Welby Hunt. Attorney, Jerome K. Walsh, who represented William, agreed that he should use the insanity defence. He relied on the testimony of mental health professionals, friends and family who testified that William was in fact insane. However, District Attorney Asa Keys was not about to let that defence get through a jury. He himself had hired his own set of psychiatrists to argue that William was perfectly sane when he murdered Marion Parker. On February the 9th of 1928, William Hickman was found guilty of first degree murder. The jury deliberated for only 36 minutes. William told the press, The die is cast and the state wins by a neck. I don't think I have much to live for and I don't know yet why I killed that Parker girl, but I did it, and I'll take my punishment. On Valentine's Day, William was sentenced to hang for the death of Marion Parker. Before guards marched William to the gallows, he'd eaten a chicken dinner and listened to records on an old Vitrola. He'd read letters from his mum and cried. He asked a guard to hear his final confession. He detailed Marion's last days. After three days of captivity, Marion began to get restless. 
William tied her to a chair in his apartment and on December the 17th he went to mail a ransom letter. When he returned, Marion insisted that he free her. She was starting to get loud and William feared that she might attract attention. William approached Marion from behind, placed a towel around her neck and strangled her. He recalled how Marion had squirmed and flailed for two minutes before she went quiet and limp. William dragged the child to his bathroom and laid her in the tub as he turned on the phonograph. William blared bye bye pretty baby as he began carving her limbs with a butcher's knife. He said that he thought she may have still been alive when he started. He insisted that revenge was not the motive. On October the 29th of 1928, William walked up the 13 squeaky steps and fainted as the executioner placed a black hood over his head. The rope was slack, too slack to break William's neck. They released the trap door and William strangled for 14 minutes before the doctor pronounced him dead. In the aftermath of Marion's murder, Geraldine and Perry Parker grieved for their child for the rest of their lives, but they never held hatred in their hearts. Whenever Perry had the opportunity, he would ask that people forgive the school employees who let his daughter go. Marjorie Parker married and lived out her life in San Diego. Their brother Perry served in the US Air Force during World War II and the Korean War. Like Marjorie, he also relocated to San Diego, where he lived to the age of 75. William Edward Hickman was once quoted as saying, If they shouldn't hang me, then they should never hang another man. My crime was one of the most gruesome in history.